Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am just super excited to have Dr. Tony Sicoria back on the show. Dr. Sicoria is a part-time practicing board-certified orthopedic surgeon in Maine, former chief of orthopedics at Chenango Memorial Hospital in Norwich, New York, and clinical assistant professor of orthopedics at SUNY Upstate Medical School in Syracuse. He received his BS in biology, BS, that sounds kind of funny, BS in biology from the Citadel and is a graduate of the Medical University of South Carolina, MD and PhD and the University of Virginia Orthopedic Surgery Residency. And Dr. Sikori is going to talk a little bit about his NDE. He talked about that in our last interview, but we'll definitely chat a bit about that again. And he was struck by lightning in 1994 while speaking on a public telephone during a family reunion. As a result of the lightning, Dr. Sorcoria had a near death and out of body experience and became a sudden savant for classical piano music and composition. Welcome back to the program, Tony. Thank you so much, Mom. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's so good to have you. And today we're going to, or you're going to talk about the, the profound talk. I'm going to use the word profound because that's what it was for me at the IONS conference this year, International Association for Near Death Studies, titled The Greatest Hoax of All, The True Nature of Man. So you talk about, you've been talking about how we've been lied to by the church and state. And so let's just start right there. Okay. Um, Basically, you know, in my quest to try to understand what happened to me and and what it all means and how in the world does it all fit together? You know, I went back and, and I tried to go back more or less to the beginning of, um, of where all this religious stuff started. And I had read a lot about how the the church, I was brought up as Catholic. And I had read a lot about how the church was started and and who was involved. And, And what brought that on was years ago when I was a kid and I was in and was in some sort of Catholic school. I don't remember exactly what what grade it was. But at the time, one of the dictums of the Catholic Church was, if you ate meat on Friday, you went to straight to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. That was it. You were done. And, and that was the way it was when I grew up. And then all of a sudden... The church came out and said, oh, we're going to change the rule. You can have meat on Friday now. And I remember going to school the next day, going and talking to one of the nuns or someone. I said, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. How can you do that? I mean, what about all those people that went to hell? What happens to them? And, And, you know, she just kind of blew me off. And but that poked a big hole in the foundation of my religious beliefs at that time, because if that was arbitrary, everything else was too. And so when I started going back and 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 trying to make sense of all this, and I was looking at some articles about Constantine, who was the emperor um, who founded the Catholic Church. 
and in the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. So what the, he had convened this council of himself and all these bishops, and they were going to decide what the Catholic Church doctrines were going to be and what books would be included in the Bible. So they were, you know, very selective about the things that they decided to put in there, and they left anything out that didn't conform to their vision of what they wanted the church to be. So there were, and there were a lot of things that Jesus had taught um, and is written about. He believed in reincarnation. Well, they couldn't have that. And so the, the emperor, it wasn't Constantine, but Justinian who came after him, who convened the second ecumenical council in and it was in 553. And they got rid of the idea of reincarnation. And the church authorities were not even invited to the meeting. And he just decided what it was going to be and then used force to, en to enforce it. So in, in, in all of those writings, there was a, a number of references of, to the fact that both Yahweh and Jesus Christ, who were the two big pinnacles of the Catholic Church, um, their characters were manipulated and some aspects of it were falsified. So, and, and the whole point of that was to ensure that man was perpetually living in fear and that the judgment and the belief in God were what were containing man in this cycle of fear, of heaven, hell, good, bad, God, and saviors. And that single life theory that they were proposing is only found in populations that were descended from or influenced by the Roman Empire. It's not ubiquitous to, to all cultures. And the truth of all of that was that you know, what I have come to realize and what I've come to read from numerous other sources is that man has a dual nature. We have a spiritual or immortal nature and a physical or mortal one. And, and there were, you know, historically, there have been lots of people who've, who've considered this. Uh, Pythagoras was one of the early ones. And he believed that God created souls as spirit entities whose goal was to merge with the divine and be eternal, trans transmigrate and reincarnate. And so a lot of the history of mankind has been hidden from us. And we've been involved in this struggle for longer than we have any idea. The two ancient priests um, the first one was uh, Menetho, who was an Egyptian priest, and he gave us the history of Egypt for 10,000 years before the, before the deluge. And during the divine rule of the gods, the demigods, and subsequently the pharaohs up to 3100 BC, Barassus, who was another priest of the Babylonian god Marduk, um, wrote that he, he wrote on stone, the history of the gods and man from 432,000 years before the deluge and prepared what's called the Sumerian King's List. So the Sumerians were an ancient civilization and probably the, the most advanced civilization um, that we know of uh, existing thousands of years before um, any of the well-known cultures, the Egyptians and all those other people. Um, and that King's List is written on a, a big stone and it's on display in the Asmolean Museum in Oxford, England. And unfortunately, you know, when, whenever, when a country pays for excavations of certain things, you know, the, they take all this stuff back to their country. And, and so the stuff is, is spread all over the place. There've been, tens of thousands of, of um, 
well, I can't draw a blank on the name of these. They're written on stone or written in clay and hardened scripts of, of different things. And, and this stuff has been just sitting in different museums. It's untranscribed. It's, you know, and, and nobody knows exactly what it says. It's in languages that can be deciphered, but they don't have the people or the, uh, the knowledge to do it well. So some of the stuff's been done, but a lot of it hasn't. Um, and so, you know, my, the, the bottom line from all of this is that, you know, we don't know what reality really is. And we don't know what our true nature is. And the only reason I have some idea of that is because I had a near-death experience. I had an out-of-body experience. And so I know that there's something else. Can you talk about that just a little sure. bit for those who so, do not? Yeah. yeah in, in 1994, we, we always have a, a communal birthday party uh, for all the people who have birthdays in August. So in August of 1994, my wife's family had, I think five people had birthdays that month. And so this was a big gathering of about 25 or so people and kids. And we had rented a, a pavilion next to a lake and the lake was called Sleepy Hollow Lake in Athens, New York. And the, you know, the name is somewhat scary in and of itself, knowing <laughs> the history of, of literature. Um, and so I was running the barbecue. Um, what, when the day started out, it was beautiful. I wasn't paying attention. But as the day went on, uh, apparently a storm brewed up over the lake, and I wasn't aware of it. And I told my brother-in-law, I said, you want to watch the grill for a little while? Because I was the barbecue guy. And I said, I want to call my mom just to make sure she's okay, because she was not there. And so I walked around the building. The, the, the party was up on the second floor of this pavilion. And I was down on the ground level um, where the barbecue was. And I, I walked around the front to, to call. And I, there's a pay phone. And I, I pick up the phone and I, I dial and, and I let the phone ring five, six, seven times. And she didn't pick up. And so at that point, I thought, all right, I might as well go back to work. So I took the phone and I started to take it away from my face and I hear this horrendous crack and this huge flash of light comes out of the phone and hits me in the face. And it just threw me back like a rag doll. And, and I was, and I, but I was aware. I mean, I knew of every millisecond of what was happening and I knew I'd been thrown back. And then all, as I was being thrown back, I had this very strange sensation of moving forward. And I was just utterly confused because I knew I'd been struck. I knew I'd been thrown back. And what didn't make sense was now I'm standing here and I'm looking around and I see the phone dangling there in front of me and nothing was making sense. And right about that moment, my mother-in-law who's up at the top of the stairs on the second floor she screams and she's running down the stairs right at me. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? But as she came down at me, down toward me, it was like I wasn't there. And she was looking off to her left. And I thought, and I and I'm now I'm utterly confused. And I as she came down and got right in front of me, and but it was like I wasn't there. And she took off to the left. And I turned to go where she was going. And suddenly I'm confronted with myself on the ground. And I, and, you know, in, in my typical vernacular, I, I, I said, oh, shit, I'm dead. And I was shocked. I mean, it was like, because I expected, I expected that when you died, there'd be something, bells and whistles, or, you know, there's be some sign that said, okay, you're dead, you're here now. And but there was nothing. It was almost just like a, a veil was pulled back. And, and I walked, I walked over to the body and I'm, there was a, a lady who was waiting to use the phone and she starts to get down to do CPR. 
and my mother-in-law is crying and I'm standing there and other people are starting to come over and I'm trying to call to them and I can see them all. I can hear them all, but nobody could see or hear me. And I'm like, all right, what, what's the point of this? Um, and then suddenly I, I'm standing there and I realize it. Oh my God, I'm thinking like I normally would. I'm carrying an honest conversation with myself. And I realized that I was conscious. And, and, I, and I thought, okay, so whatever this is on the ground, it's not me. Whoever I am, I always am because I'm still here. And I'm still thinking exactly the way I normally would and behaving like I normally would. And at that point, I thought, well, there's no point in sticking around here because I didn't know what else to do. And I thought, well, I'll go check on my family. So I decided to, to turn around and I'm walking toward the stairs. I go and I start going up the stairs, but I'm looking down at the stairs because it's customary for me to do that. I don't want to trip and fall and land on my face. And as I'm looking down at the stairs, I get up to about the third stair and I realize that my legs are dissolving. And I'm thinking, whoa, this is getting really weird. And, and and by the time I got to the top of that flight of stairs, I had lost all form. I was just a ball of energy, but I'm still conscious. I'm still thinking. And at this point, the stairs actually go up to the left. And I just went through the wall and I came out right above where my wife was sitting. And she was sitting on a, on a couch and she was chained painting children's faces. And I made a mental note of where the kids were and what alignment where she was stand where she was sitting and they were all standing in front of her. And and then I but I kept going. And when I passed through the building, things really started to get interesting. At that point I it was like I had fallen into a, a river of pure positive energy. And, and the most incredible feeling because it was absolute love and absolute peace. And there was nothing else in it. And, and that was very striking to me. And I remember the feeling of the, the bluish white light reminded me of, of when I was a kid and I would go swimming in streams and I would lay down on the ground, on the bottom of the, of the stream and I would look up and the light would be pouring through the water and would have this glistening sort of appearance to it. And it reminded me of that. And then I was, I was looking around trying to, to make sense of it. And as I looked around, I could see other things, other objects, but what was different was that I could see that not only could I feel that energy, but I could see it. And, and that's what really kind of freaked me out a little bit because I could see it almost looked like sine waves going through things. But the reality of it was whatever this energy was that I was feeling made up everything is what flowed through everything and made everything up. And I thought this must be the God energy. And, and I thought this is something you could measure. I mean, I, you know, the science brain starts kicking in and I'm like, oh, I can measure this, um, you know, but I didn't have a clue. But that was, a, you know, those were those were a couple of really big moments. Um, and then it it was taking me someplace. It, you know, I call it a, a flow of pure positive energy. And it really was because it was I was being dragged someplace. And I was just going with wherever, with wherever this flow was taking me. And, and, you know, there was nothing bad about it. And I, I remember having a, a short, you know, review of, of big and, and big things in my life. It was almost like a collage of, of pictures that just flashed. And, and it wasn't anything in depth, um, but just, you know, just kind of went through this this collage of pictures, if you will. And right about this time, you know, I feel that I had this sensation of motion. I was, I was going somewhere and had speed and direction. 
Um, so I, I didn't know exactly what it was or where I was going, uh, but I was ecstatic because this was the most amazing feeling anybody could ever have. And right about the time that I had come to the realization that this was the greatest thing in the world, and it's like somebody flipped a switch and I was back in my body. And I was so angry. I, I remember sitting there, laying there going, no, please don't make me come back. I don't want to do this. I, want, I just want to keep going wherever I was going. And, you know, the realization came to me, that, you know, suck it up, buddy. This is not your decision. I'm like, okay. Um, so now I'm, I'm back in his body and, and it hurt like hell where it hit me in the face and came out my foot felt like two hot pokers had been stabbed in me. And I was still unconscious, but, and I couldn't open my eyes, but they, the lady had stopped CPR and I could sense she was next to me. And I'm just, you know, I'm just laying there going, this, this is really painful. And, and I'm trying to recover enough to, to wake up. And finally it seemed like minutes later, I was able to open my eyes and I couldn't focus on anything. And, and she said something, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, just, I wanted to say thank you for saving my life, but stupidly, the only thing that came out was it's okay. I'm a doctor. <laughs> and she just laughed and said, well, you weren't a moment ago. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh my God, of all the most ridiculous things you could have said. And at that point I realized, just keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't say anything because nothing's going to come out the way you want it to. And, you know, they called the police and they were calling an ambulance. And I said, I I'm not going to the hospital. And, you know, at the time, my magical thinking was, you know, with lightning, you're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. Wow. And which, you know, it's really stupid. I should have gone. But, um, you know, that was my thought at the time. And so I. The, you know, I had my family take me home and they, I called, as we were on the way, I called my neurologist and my, my family doctor, who was also a cardiologist, and I called them and told them what happened. And they told me to come right over. So I, I just went, saw both of them and they, you know, did whatever test they needed to do and said, well, you know, you're just very lucky. Um you know, you've, you've managed to skate through this one. So Tony, was it, I always have to ask this. I hear, hear people like you say, it's just so much more real than this reality. Is that the way it was for you? You know, it was, it was really clear that the reality that, that we experience um, is not at all what the true reality could be. And what I was experiencing was so much more real in essence than, than a, this, is, this is an illusion. This is, this is not real reality. And, and I thought a lot about that. And, you know, our, our brains have been, through evolution have been designed to only see certain things. We see certain molecular structures. We look at that and we say, okay, that's a desk. But what the quantum mechanics people tell us is that all of those molecules that make up that desk are shared with everything else. And it's like, okay, so how, you know, how is it that we look at that collection of molecules and we see something? And it's just our brain is, has been designed and imprinted with that kind of knowledge. And we're not, we're not even allowed to consider the other things that it could be. So somebody from an, an alien civilization could come and look at that same collection of molecules and say, well, that's not a desk, it's something else. Okay, so, you know, we are conditioned to see the reality that we exist in at this time. Um, but what I've come to realize 
through 27 years of reading and 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 trying to come to grips with this is that all of these things exist in in other places and we are part of a much bigger picture we just don't we don't know how to access it we don't know we have no understanding of it because we've been lied to for so long about what our nature is that it's hard for us to conceive of anything else. I know in your talk, you um, at IONS, you talked a little bit about the materialist reduction school versus the non-reductionist view. Could you just, could you speak on that? For sure. A and while you're looking for that, I love the quote that you mentioned in your talk by Ian Steven, even, Ian Stevenson, there is nothing more troublesome than a new experience or idea, especially in science. Yeah, I think he really hit it on the head. And it's true because, you know, science is very unforgiving about new ideas. And there's an old saying that says, scientific progress is made one death at a time. And, and what that means is, the, I mean, the old guard prevents new ideas and, and things stay hidden until they die off and the new ideas are allowed to come out. And, and to some extent, there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, it's very unfortunate. Um, but basically, the you know I was I, in the talk I was talking about the science of of a near death experience, right? And it's it was not a new idea. One of the first recorded cases was in Plato's The Republic. Er E R was from Pamphylia. He was the son of Armenius, and he was killed in a battle. Um, and Customarily, they would have a funeral pyre for people. Um, and so 10 days later, he's on his funeral pyre and he wakes up. He's not dead. And he starts telling everyone about the place that he went to. And he had been to the underworld and he told them what was awaiting them in an afterlife that the just were rewarded and the wicked were punished and souls would re be reborn into a new life. And so this was one of the first recorded cases of somebody having a near-death experience. And out of all of this, there have been two schools of thought that have come out. One is what I call the materialist or reductionist school and the non-reductionist school. So the material or reductionist school is typical science. Um, nothing exists except objective reality and consciousness comes from the brain. So, you know, the, the people who have pushed that idea are, you know, typical, uh, typical science. Um, Oliver Sacks, Kevin Nelson, many others, um, they're all great scientists in their own right, um, but they always had a very rigid view of what is acceptable. And they, they were very certain that consciousness came from the brain and that when you had a near-death experience or out-of-body experience, it was coming from a dying brain and it was a hallucination um, that it was all a natural end of a process. And the non-reductionist um, of, of which I am a member of um, says that consciousness is not located in the brain. And there's lots of people in this group, um, Pim Van Lommel, Bruce Grayson, uh, Sam Parnia, Ray Moody, lots of, lots of science people um, have been working on this for some time. And and the ultimate discussion of that is that consciousness is not local. Um, it's not located in a particular time or space. And, and so it all came down to, 
what was consciousness? And, and that's when I quoted Ian Stevenson about there's nothing more troublesome than a new idea, particularly in science. So the idea of what is consciousness. And, and in, the, in my talk, I talked about a, a spectacular case of Pam Reynolds. And why did I think that was an important case? Because that's one of the few examples that we have of a monitored near death and out of body experience. So, you know, and, and, and briefly, this woman had an aneurysm in her brain that had to be taken out. So to successfully do it, they would have to stop her heart, drain all the blood out of her brain, and take the or then take the aneurysm out and restart everything. So they they made sure that she couldn't hear anything, she couldn't see anything. She her brain was monitored by three different methods to make sure that her brain was flatline. So they put her on bypass, heart bypass. They stopped her heart. They drained the blood out of her brain. Now her brain is monitored flatline. There's nothing going on. And it's, it's all recorded. And they do the surgery. And they wake her back up and, and restart her heart. And she goes to the intensive care unit. So she starts talking about all this weird stuff that happened to her when she was in the operating room. She had popped out of her body. And she was sitting on Dr. Spetzler, who that's the guy's surgeon. She was sitting on his shoulder and he was wa she was watching him cut her head open, cut the skull. She described the instruments, what they sounded like. She described the tables, the way they were arranged. Um, she described the conversation between the vascular surgeon and the neurosurgeon, where the vascular surgeon, when they went to put her on bypass, he opened up the, the, I think it was the right femoral artery and it was too small for the connector. And then he said, okay, I'm going to have to open up the other side. And so she had heard all of this mm -hmm. and she started telling everybody all these things that she heard. She had left her body and gone through a tunnel and she met up with her uncle and uh, I think it was her grandmother. Um, I have to check. I don't remember exactly, but um, wow! Yeah, it was her grand. He was her grandmother and her uncle, and you know they walked with her in a tunnel for a short distance, and she was walking toward this light. And she says, "I'm going there," and they said, "No, you're not," and she said, "I most certainly am," and they managed to get her turned around. And they're walking with her and she got to the end of the tunnel and she says, I'm not going back. And they said, yes, you are. And they pushed her. Um, they pushed her out of the tunnel and that coincided with the starting of her heart. Wow. And so here she is, she's in the recovery room. She's talking about all this stuff and telling them what she saw. And, and one of the things that she she also relayed was that when the surgeon had finished the delicate part of the operation, the residents took over to do the closure. And so they put on some music and they put on the music called the hotel California. And she was very angry about that because it was, it was, this was music by the Eagles and the song was the hotel California. She, um, she was angry about it because there was one line in the song said, that said, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And she was angry because she didn't wanna go back to her body and she wanted to go to the light and she was not allowed to do so. And she felt like that, that song very much summarized the feeling that she was having at that moment. And you know, she, you know, she was on wow. many different television shows and radio shows, all mm. sorts of things talking about this stuff. So, but the, my point in all of that was that this was, this is one of the few and maybe the only real example of a monitored 
cardiac arrest, complete brain death, yet a real near death and out of body experience. Right. So, you know, I, I think it's an important um, piece of information. Um, so, you know, that, that really was the, the impetus of, of what, of what I wanted to show with that, you know, and, and a number of Pim Van Lommel is one of the people that's been a proponent of, of non-locality. Um, and so we, when we realized that through her experience and many other people's that, that consciousness is not located in the brain. It's located someplace else. Where is it? Good question. We don't know that. Um, there's lots of speculation that it's in the fabric of the, the quantum, the quantum everything. Um, and that in memory and all of these things are stored in this three-dimensional construct of, of what quantum reality is. Um, and it's, you know, at this point, it's, it's pure mystery of, of how it all works together. Um, but one of the things that when, when he talks about when, what Pim Van Lovell was talking about non-locality of, of consciousness, um, in that, in my talk, I had used a, a video of Dr. Quantum, who was a, uh, a car cartoon character. And what he was trying to show was that everything is related. And there was an experiment done by Joshua Bell. I think it was 1964 or something like that. Um, and he was able to prove that if you took a molecule and, and you took two electrons from that molecule, and you sent them to opposite ends of the universe. If you did something to one, the other would instantaneously react. And, and what they did was they would, in el electrons that are paired, one spins one way and one spins the other. And so they would force one to change its spin and the other one would immediately spin the other way. Wow. No, and it's, there's no way that, we don't have any mathematical way of instantaneous communication like that. It, and that's why they're calling it's non-local. Right. There's no local um, qualities about it. It's, it's just something that occurs in, instantaneously. But if you consider that everything came from one source, so the idea of the Big Bang, everything occurred at one time, everything is still related. Right. And, and that, and that makes a lot of sense when, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, how, how can we be conscious about something on the other side of the world? Um, how can, I don't know if you've ever heard of remote viewing, yes. but remote viewing is something the CIA and, and all of the big agencies have used for years to spy on the other guys. And not only that, but, you know, it's become a real science. Mm -hmm. and, and people who are remote viewers can look anywhere instantaneously and see something. Um, the, one of the great examples was, was made by Ingo Swan, who was one of the earliest remote viewers. And when one of the Voyager um, spaceships that we had sent out was going to go past Jupiter and they, and they went to him and they said, tell us what Jupiter's, tell us what the satellite is going to see when it passes Jupiter. And he sat down for a few minutes and he said, there's a ring around Jupiter. And they were like, nonsense. We don't think there's a ring around Jupiter. We've got telescopes and we don't see anything. 
guess what? When the, when <laughs> it went by Jupiter, what's the first thing that it saw? The ring around Jupiter. Right. So, you know, the fact that people can do this uh, means we all can do it. And and he was one of the first ones that would tell you that. You know, he said, everybody can do this. We have this ability. Um, we are not limited to time and space. And so now, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, this, the same thing. And I'm saying, you know, I've had a near-death experience. And I know that we're not limited by time and space. And that we are all interrelated in some way that I don't understand. And now I'm hearing it from left field. I'm hearing it from someplace else entirely that is highly credentialed and is feeding into the same idea. And so now we're seeing, we're seeing this coming from a lot of different places. And do you, do you agree that, so the science and materialist, of course, community wants evidence, evidence, evidence. And, and that's what science is all about, right? Sure. And, but all of these anecdotes, all of these tens of millions of stories of near-death experiences and all the other, other things like remote viewing, you know, recall of past lives with children and telepathy, just all every, this shared death experiences. What's so profound to me is first of all, the love, and I just like for you to come on this, the love and the sense of peace that you feel and really want to go there, even though, you know, your family's here and there's just that, that sense of love that we can't comprehend, number one. And number two is the transformation of people after they had the, those experiences, just, just like you. So can you just comment, comment on that? Sure. I mean, after having had an experience like that, how could you not be honest and and acknowledge the fact that okay there's there's there are things that I don't understand mm -hmm. there you know and the feeling of it is unbelievable and it makes an impression that you could never forget and you measure everything else by it and and the fact that everyone who has this experience has a very similar experience. So there's, there has to be commonality to it. And, and the fact that, I mean, the, the, I guess from a standpoint of, I mean, we've always been taught that God is love. Um, but that was meaningless to me until I felt it. And, and that was kind of a, a real eye opener for me was that, you know, this love that they talk about is actually an energy. I mean, you can feel it, you can see it, and you absolutely are certain um, that it exists. And, you know, how do we, you know, and I've, I've spent you know, for the, the last several decades trying to find it again um, and try to understand what it meant, where it came from, and how do I get access to that, not only that feeling, but how do I progress to the next step of, of discovery? And I've gone through, I've been to energy practitioners and and I've actually been able to come out of my body um, with the assistance um, of, of a practitioner um, and it scared the living bejesus out of me because I didn't you know I was like I, I went I, was, I remember a lot in this one particular time I was lying there and she'd been doing all of this meditation stuff with me and 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 I'm thinking, I'm conscious. I'm I'm absolutely wide awake. And I'm thinking, this is such BS. This is not working. 
And all of a sudden I hear myself snoring. And I was like, holy crap, oh I'm asleep, but I'm awake. And, and right about that time, I started to come out. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to get sick. I thought I would, you know, it's because it was, it was like this. It wasn't just a nice steady. It was kind of, I was out and I was about four feet above. And I'm, and it's like, I'm on this ocean of, of air that's not still. And, and I remembered, you know, it's like, I was kind of scared because it was like, wasn't what I expected. Right. And, and so I find that there's a difference between just being able to separate and, and a near death. I, I think the near death experience gives you a little bit more because the, the, you're, the, there's no connection. You're, you know, you've cut the tie, you're completely free. And, and now you can, you can move along a different pathway. So, but it is possible. Um, and I know that there are lots of people that are working on technologies to do that. Um, some with sound, some with meditation. So it, it varies. Yeah, so many. So, so we need to start, start to wrap it up. But so where, where do you go from here? You've done all this research and, you know, searching for the true, true nature of man. And I think that you have a lot of, do I want to say questions answered? Um, I will say that for your, for yourself. And I know for me and many others. And so where do you go with all of this now? And how, how's your music going? <laughs> for my <laughs> listeners, we didn't even talk about this. So, so Tony came back with this insatiable desire to play classical music and you're a rock and roll guy, right? Yeah. And now yeah. you, now you, do and you yeah i you know i still i still work on on my compositions and you know the music still comes to me um i've i've started to get into more complex pieces of music with um piano and orchestra um and and the stuff still keeps coming and so you know i try to i try to flow with it right. um so do you feel you know, like you get do you feel like you get a little of that feeling back of when you were on the on the other side? That feeling of that when you get into the flow of your music? You know, when you when you actually make that connection, yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's a strange feeling of of when you make that connection. It's like, yes, I'm there and now, and and it flows, right. um, and it's very noticeable when it happens. Um, you know, where am I going with all of it? I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book about it. Nice. Um, and, and it's, it's been a challenge because I want to talk about, you know, all the things that I talked about in the talk, mm -hmm. I want to go into in depth, um, in my book. And, and there are, there is so much more to know, you know, it's like, you know, how, how have we wound up in this in this situation where we instead of ascending and becoming and going to a higher level of spiritual evolution, we wind up being reincarnated and coming back here and having to go through this nonsense all over again? Wow, so much to learn and so oh, much to discover. And it, so it's crazy. So why do you think more people, when they hear all these near-death experiences and all the other, you know, that's just the one aspect of it, so much material, that people aren't more excited about this news? Well, I, it upsets the apple cart. Apple cart. You know, people are, are very happy to just have swept all of their information into a nice, neat pile, and it's like, okay, I, I understand this pile and I have no desire to 
to investigate further. And, and you know, everybody's different. And I have always been, I want to know why. Right. And, and that has been a blessing and a curse. Um, well, you know, like, Bruce, like, like Bruce Grayson said, he said, I was very happy being a materialist scientist <laughs> until I started hearing all these stories and I yeah. had to change my hair, my whole, you know, paradigm, my, my. And, and that's really what it comes down to. It, it's, it's going to be, you either have to go this way or that way. Right. And, and there's not much in the middle. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues with taking one choice over another. Mm. So, you know, your, your friends are going to think you're crazy. Right. And, you know, nobody wants to, you know, if you start talking about this stuff, everybody just disappears. Um, it's like, okay, you know what? And, and I've, I'm good with that. And, you know, it's taken me a long time to, you know, to, to feel comfortable with thinking differently and, and being able to, to keep what I feel is true in my heart when other people think that, you know, that you're wasting your time. Well, Tony, thank you so much for coming oh. back on the show today. I can't wait for your book. And is there anything else you'd like to like to say before before we end? No, the only the only thing that that I have learned from from all of this more recent is that the the key to progression from third density to fourth is service to others yes. and and that is the key and the measurement of your spiritual intent if if 51 percent of your life is concerned with service to others you're a candidate to progress to the next level if not guess what you come back and do it again mm not a pleasant thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so You're much. Welcome. I really appreciate it. And once again, congratulations on your new grandson. Thank you. Yes. What, what does he call you or what will he call you? <laughs> He's yeah. only days old. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't called me much yet, <laughs> wow. but he's, you know, it's, his name is Jude. Yes. Love and it. he'll be, uh, It'd be interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And my pleasure. You have a great rest of the day. Thanks. You as well. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Thanks Bye -bye. so much to see you. It's good to see you. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you. Thank you.